Okay, get ready for a wild one, because today we're cracking open a Shakespearean mystery box. We're talking about the possibility of secret messages embedded in Shakespeare's sonnets, hinting at the real author's identity. Have you ever wondered, even for a second, if Shakespeare really was Shakespeare? I mean, the guy was a genius, no doubt, but the conspiracy theories are just too juicy to ignore, right? This deep dive takes us down one such rabbit hole. We're looking at a YouTube video essay by Bastian Conrad that claims the sonnets, specifically the 1642nd edition, hold the key to uncovering a massive literary hoax. What's fascinating is that this video goes beyond the usual did Shakespeare write Shakespeare debate. It zeroes in on the 1640 edition and argues that it was deliberately crafted to send a coded message about the author's true identity, someone who, according to the video, was very much alive in 1640. That's right. Now, before you dismiss this as complete balderdash, let's rewind a bit. Shakespeare's early works like Venus and Adonis and Lucrece, those were instant bestsellers reprinted multiple times. But the sonnets, not so much. The first edition dropped in 1609 and then crickets. A full generation later, boom, the 1640 edition appears rearranged and edited. Which brings us to the mysterious Mr. John Benson, the publisher behind this second edition. And... He is quite the enigma. We don't have a ton of information about Benson, his life, his editorial credentials. It's all a bit murky. This lack of clarity, of course, adds fuel to the conspiracy fire. It's like something's off, right? And that feeling intensifies when you compare the engravings of Shakespeare from the 1623 First Folio, hmm. which, by the way, was a huge GE deal, basically compiling all of Shakespeare's plays so they wouldn't be lost forever with the one in this 1640 edition. The video makes a big deal about how the 1640 engraving is like a mirror image of the first folios, almost like it's trying to tell us, hey, pay attention, something's different here. And the poem accompanying this 1640 engraving, it explicitly talks about shadow over substance, even referring to the image as Shakespeare's shadow. Mm -hmm. It's like it's deliberately separating the man from the image, which let's be honest, is pretty eerie. Super creepy, right? And then there's the whole laurel wreath situation. You know, the laurel wreath is like the ultimate symbol of a poet laureate, a mark of true poetic greatness. Right, it's steeped in the literary tradition. But in this 1640 engraving, Shakespeare isn't wearing the laurel wreath like Ben Jonson does in his portrait. He's holding it, almost like he's offering it to someone else. He's saying, this isn't really for me, it belongs to someone else. Mm. And the video's interpretation, the real author wanted us to know that this Shakespeare, the one in the engraving, wasn't the true poet. Exactly. The video claims that whoever was behind the 1640 edition knew their literary symbolism and had a very specific message to convey. Now, buckle up, because here's where it gets really interesting. The video argues that the real author, who they believe was still kicking in 1640, rearranged the sonnets to embed a hidden message. And they point to sonnets 67, 68, and 69, which Benson conveniently grouped under the title The Glory of Beauty as the epicenter of this coded message. The Glory of Beauty loaded title, right? Yeah. Especially if you entertain the possibility that someone else entirely penned these masterpieces. Exactly. The video reads these sonnets as the authors attempt to subtly reveal their true identity. For example, Sonnet 67 talks about a false painting imitating someone's cheek. The video interprets this as a direct reference to that 1640 engraving we were just talking about. It's like the sonnet is winking at us saying, See, this image is a fake, a clever disguise hiding the true author's living hue. <laughs> the video suggests that Shakespeare, as it was sometimes spelled, was a mask, a convenient name concealing the true author's identity. Okay, I'm hooked. What about the other sonnets? What hidden gems did you unearth there? Well, Sonnet 68, that's where the intrigue really kicks in. It talks about someone living a second life on second head. Oh, wow. The video claims this is a huge E clue, pointing to the author having to ditch their real name and live this secret life under a pseudonym. A second life on second head? Mmm. I mean, you can't get much more on the nose than that, right? It's like a scene straight out of a spy thriller. And when you consider the possibility of the author being forced into hiding, these lines become even more loaded. Right. Like, imagine being this brilliant writer, unable to claim your own work because you're trapped behind this second head, this fabricated identity. Exactly. And then we get to Sonnet 69, which talks about this mismatch between outward appearance, the show, and a person's true essence, their odor. So is the video saying that Shakespeare's public persona was just a front and his true odor, his genius, actually belonged to someone else? That's the claim. The video draws a distinction between Shakespeare of Stratford, this supposedly offensive person, and the true author, the one with the real talent, the yeah. true odor. 
wow, okay, so we've got these sonnets hinting at a secret identity. But the video doesn't stop there, right? They even bring in those dedicatory verses by Leonard Diggs, James Maybe, and John Warren in the 1640 edition, claiming they also support this theory. Exactly. And this is where the video starts weaving in an even bigger conspiracy theory. Yeah. The idea that Christopher Marlowe, a contemporary of Shakespeare, mm -hmm. might actually be the true author behind the plays and poems. Wait, hold up a sec. For those of us who aren't Shakespeare scholars, who exactly was Christopher Marlowe? Marlowe was a playwright, a contemporary of Shakespeare. They were both writing and producing plays in London around the same time. Actually, Marlowe was wildly popular in those early days, even more so than Shakespeare at first. Really? So what happened? Well, that's the million-dollar question. Marlowe died in 1593, supposedly in a tavern brawl. But here's where things get interesting. Okay, I'm sensing a but coming. There's always a but with conspiracies, right? Some scholars, the Marlovians as they're called, believe that Marlowe's death was staged. They point to inconsistencies in the reports of his death and suggest he might have gone into hiding, maybe even fled abroad, and continued writing under the name William Shakespeare. Okay, so we've got a potentially faked death, a secret identity, and a whole lot of speculation. But is there any actual evidence to support this Marlowe as Shakespeare theory? Well, like many good conspiracy theories, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence and interpretation of events, but no smoking gun, so to speak. Marlowians will point to similarities in the writing styles and themes between Marlowe's known works and Shakespeare's plays. Yeah, I see how that would pique some interest. And then there's the timing of it all. Shakespeare seemingly burst onto the scene after Marlowe's death. Like this unknown actor from Stratford suddenly transformed into a literary genius overnight. It's definitely an intriguing coincidence. It certainly makes you wonder. But how does the video link all of this back to the 1640 sonnets and those dedicatory verses? Good question. Let's start with Leonard Diggs. He wrote verses for both the first folio, you know, that super important collection of Shakespeare's plays, and the 1640 sonnet edition. Two very different publications. Absolutely. In the first folio, Diggs famously writes, be sure our Shakespeare, thou canst never die, but crowned with laurel, live eternally. Okay, so far, so good. But wait, didn't we just say that in the 1640 engraving, Shakespeare isn't wearing the laurel wreath? Exactly. That's where the video starts connecting the dots. It's as if Diggs is acknowledging a discrepancy, a difference between the image of Shakespeare and the reality. Like he's in on the secret, too. This is getting juicy. And then in his 1640 verse, Diggs writes about some second Shakespeare, who deserves recognition but can't claim it openly. Some second Shakespeare. <laughs> you don't think he's literally talking about a second Shakespeare, do you? Like, maybe Shakespeare had a secret twin. Huh. Well, the video certainly latches onto that phrase. They argue it's proof that the true author was alive and well in 1640, working behind the scenes. They even point out that Diggis spells Shakespeare's name as Shakespeare in this verse suggesting it might be a deliberate clue. Oh, come on. Even I know you can't build a whole conspiracy theory on a hyphen. I know, I know. But you have to admit, it's fun to consider these possibilities. Okay, fair enough. Well, what about this James Maybe character? What cryptic message did he supplestamante leave us? Well, Maybe's verse is very theatrical in its language. He talks about the world stage and Shakespeare going, but forth to enter with applause and actor's art. It sounds like he was a bit of a drama queen, this Maybe fellow. Right. But then he adds, can die and live to act a second part. Whoa. Okay, now I'm listening. Die and live to act a second part. Uh, that's awfully specific, isn't it? And that's precisely what the video seizes on. They argue that maybe is intentionally blurring the lines between the theater where actors pretend to be other people and reality, suggesting that Shakespeare is just a role being played by someone else. Okay, I'm picking up what you're putting down. So what does maybe have to say for himself in 1640? Surely he clears this whole thing up, right? Actually, in his 1640 verse maybe gets even bolder. He writes about a dramatic poet who knows and sees thee as thou art more near than any other. Hold on. Is he implying that there's someone out there who knew the real Shakespeare better than anyone else? The video certainly thinks so. They claim this dramatic poet is the true author, the one who had moved on from the Shakespeare persona, while maybe felt obligated to honor their legacy in this cryptic way. It's like they're passing these coded messages back and forth, right under everyone's noses. And then there's John Warren. What's his contribution to this conspiracy chain letter? Warren only wrote a verse for the 1640 edition, but he makes it count. He talks about Shakespeare being revived, experiencing a second life. The video claims this is Warren straight up referencing the author's fake death and their continued existence in this second life under a new name. I have to admit, even if it's completely bonkers, 
The sheer audacity of it all is kind of impressive. It's like they're playing a giant game of literary clue, leaving breadcrumbs for future generations to decipher. That's the allure of conspiracy theories, isn't it? Mm. They tap into our desire for hidden knowledge, for a more exciting version of reality. Right. Like, what if everything we thought we knew was wrong? What if there's a secret history waiting to be unearthed, hidden in plain sight within the pages of our favorite books? And what's so captivating about this particular theory is that it centers around Shakespeare, the ultimate literary icon. Exactly. I mean, the idea that someone else might be behind those legendary plays and sonnets, it's almost too much to handle. It's like we've stumbled into this amazing literary thriller, right, with all these secret identities and coded messages and Marlowe maybe, you know, penning these masterpieces from beyond the grave. It's mind-blowing. It really makes you rethink everything you thought you knew about Shakespeare, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, even if you're not totally sold on Marlowe actually being Shakespeare, and let's be real, that's a tough pill to swallow. Right. The idea of these hidden messages, this secret history woven into the fabric of these famous works, it's captivating. Definitely. It reminds us that we don't always have the full picture when it comes to history. Right. There are always different sides to the story, conflicting accounts, missing pieces. That makes you wonder about the stories that haven't been told, you know? The voices we haven't heard. Exactly. And who's to say there isn't some truth hidden within even the wildest theories? That's what I love about this deep dive. It's a good reminder that even texts written centuries ago can still surprise us, challenge us, make us look at the world in a whole new way. It really speaks to the power of literature, don't you think? To spark debate and keep us guessing, even after all this time. So where does this leave us? Have we finally cracked the code? Unmasked the real Shakespeare? Well, I'll let you be the judge. We've laid out the evidence. Explore the arguments. Unpack the symbolism. Now it's your turn to weigh the possibilities and see what conclusions you reach. Do you think those coded messages are real? Was John Benson part of some grand conspiracy? And could Christopher Marlowe actually be the mastermind behind Shakespeare's greatest works? Whatever you decide, one thing's for sure. This deep dive has definitely added another layer of mystery to the already fascinating world of Shakespeare. That's the beauty of a good deep dive, right? It's not always about finding all the answers. It's about the thrill of the chase. The excitement of exploring the unknown. And sometimes the best stories are the ones we create ourselves. So next time you pick up a book, remember, there might be more hidden between the lines than you think. Happy reading, everyone.